Hello. I'm going to be reading Despero for the people who missed the first couple chapters or are feeling lost or just want to hear it again. Here we go. The world is dark and light is precious. Come closer, dear reader. You must trust me. I am telling you a story. And this is the beginning of the book. Okay? So. Book the first. A mouse is born. Chapter one, the last one. This story begins within the walls of a castle with the birth of a mouse, a small mouse, the last mouse born to his parents and the only one of his litter to be born alive. Boys and girls, the litter, you remember, is a collective noun and it's when mice have babies, they have many babies at once, maybe you know, eight, ten at the same time. But this mouse was the last of his litter to be born alive. There are my babies, said the exhausted mother when the ordeal was all over. Show to me my babies. The father mouse held one small mouse up high. There, there is only this one, he said. The others are dead. Mon Dieu, just the one baby mouse. Just the one. Will you name him? All of that work for nothing, and said the mother. She sighed. Oh, it is so sad. It is such a disappointment. She was a French mouse who had arrived at the castle long ago in the luggage of a visiting French diplomat. Disappointment was one of her favorite words. She used it often. Boys and girls, I hope you're following along in the book, okay? We're on page 12, second paragraph. Will you name him? repeated the father. Will I name him? Will I name him? Of course I will name him. But he will only die like the others. Oh, so sad. Oh, such a tragedy. The mouse mother held a handkerchief to her nose and then waved it in front of her face. She sniffed. I will name him. Yes, I will name him. This mouse despero for all the sadness, for the many despairs of this place. Now, where is my mirror? Her husband handed her a small shard of mirror. A shard is a slice, a piece, because remember, they're mice, so it's probably a piece that was broken on the floor that they brought into their house behind the wall. The husband handed her a small shard of mirror. The mouse mother, whose name was Antoinette, looked at her reflection and gasped out loud. <gasps> to news, she said to one of her sons. Get for me my makeup bag. My eyes are a fright. While Antoinette touched up her eye makeup, the mouse father put Despero down on a bed made of blanket scraps. The April sun, weak but determined, shone through the castle window and from there squeezed itself through a small hole in the wall and placed one golden finger on the little mouse. Boys and girls, the finger is a finger of light, not a real human finger, but the light, one sliver of light coming through the wall and touches him. The other older mice children gathered around to stare at Despero. His ears are too big, said his sister Merlot. Those are the biggest ears I've ever seen. Look, said the brother named Furlow. His eyes are open, Pa. His eyes are open. They shouldn't be open. It is true. Despero's eyes should not have been open. But they were. He was staring at the sun, reflecting off his mother's mirror. 
The light was shining onto the ceiling in an oval of brilliance. And he was smiling up at the sight. There's something wrong. Oh, no. There's something wrong with him, said the father. Leave him alone. Despero's brothers and sisters stepped back away from this new mice. This is the last, proclaimed Antoinette from her bed. I will have no more mice babies. They are such a disappointment. They are hard on my beauty. Despero's eyes should not have been open. That's the illustration on this page. There's Antoinette looking at herself in the mirror. And there's the father, and there's Despero. And there's probably that's Herlo, the brother, or Toulouse. And there's little Despero in the middle. That's Despero. Okay. They ruined me for my looks. This is the last one. No more. The last one, said the father, and he'll be dead soon. He can't live. Not with his eyes open like that. But reader, he did live. This is his story. Now, boys and girls, mice, real mice, are born with their eyes closed, and they don't open them for a couple of days. Okay, they, they keep them closed. Um, so this is really weird that Despero was born with his eyes open. And what is the first thing he notices? Light. Hmm. Chapter 2, Such a Disappointment. Page 16, so follow along in your book. Despero Tilling lived. That's his last name, Tilling. Despero Tilling. But his existence was cause for much speculation in the mouse community. He's the smallest mouse I've ever seen, said his Aunt Florence. It's ridiculous. No mouse has ever been this small. Not even a tilling. She looked at Despero through narrowed eyes as if she expected him to dis disappear entirely. No mouse, she said again, ever. Despero, his tail wrapped around his feet, looked, stared back at her. Those are some big ears he's got too observed his uncle Alfred. They look more like donkey ears, if you ask me. They are obscenely large ears, said Aunt Florence. Despero wiggled his ears. You know I can do that. His Aunt Florence gasped. <gasps> they say he was born with his eyes open, whispered Uncle Alfred. Despero stared hard at his uncle. Impossible, said Aunt Florence. No mouse, no matter how small or obscenely large-eared, is ever born with his eyes open. It simply isn't done. His pa, Lester, says he's not well, said Uncle Alfred. Despero sneezed. Achoo! He said nothing in defense of himself. How could he? Everything his aunt and uncle said was true. He was ridiculously small. His ears were obscenely large. He had been born with his eyes open, and he was sickly. He coughed and sneezed so often that he carried a handkerchief in one paw at all times. He ran temperatures. He fainted at loud noises. <sighs> Most alarming of all, he showed no interest in the things a mouse should show interest in. He did not think constantly of food. He was not intent on tracking down every crumb. And while his larger, older siblings ate, Despero stood with his head, cocked to one side, holding very still. Do you hear that sweet sound, he said? I hear the sound of cake crumbs falling out of people's mouths and Hitting the floor, said his brother Toulouse. That's what I hear. No, said Despero. It's something else. It sounds like, um, honey. You might have big ears, said Toulouse. 
but they're not attached right to your brain. You don't hear honey. You smell honey when there's honey to smell, which there isn't. Son, barked Despero's father. Snap it. Snap to it. Get your head out of the clouds and hunt for crumbs. Please, said his mother. Look for the crumbs. Eat them to make your mama happy. You are such a skinny mouth. You are a disappointment to your mama. Sorry, said Despero. He lowered his head and sniffed the castle floor. Sniffed. But reader, he was not smelling. He was listening with his big ears to the sweet sound that no other mouse seemed to hear. Chapter 3. Once upon a time. Despero's siblings tried to educate him in the ways of being a mouse. His brother Furlo took him on a tour of the castle to demonstrate the art of scurrying. Move from side to side, instructed Furlo, scrabbling across the wax castle floor. Look over your shoulder all the time. First to the right, then to the left. Don't stop for anything. But Despero wasn't listening to Furlo. He was staring at the light, pouring in through the stained glass windows of the castle. He stood on his hind legs and held his handkerchief over his heart and stared up, up to the brilliant light. Furlo, he said, what is that thing? What are all those colors? Are we in heaven? Cripes! shouted Furlow from far corner. Don't stand there in the middle of the floor talking about heaven. Move! You're a mouse, not a man. You've got a scurry. What? said Despero, still staring at the light. But Furlow was gone. He had, like a good mouse, disappeared into a hole in the molding. That's at the bottom of of the wall, you see, there's a hole there. Despero's sister Merlot took him into the castle library where light came streaming in through tall, high windows and landed on the floor in bright yellow patches. Here, said Merlot, follow me, small brother, and I will instruct you on the fine points of how to nibble paper. Here, oh, Merlot scurried up the chair and from there hopped onto the table, which there sat a huge open book. This way, small brother, she said, as she crawled onto the pages of the book, and Despero followed her from the chair to the table to the page. Now then, said Merlot, this glue here is tasty, and the paper edges are crunchy and yummy. Like so, she nibbled the edge of the page and then looked at Despero. You should look at the picture on the page there. It's very cute. You try, said she said. First, take a bite of some glue. Then follow it with the crunch of the paper. Mm. I lost my place. Oh, and these squiggles... They're very tasty. Despero looked down at the book and something remarkable happened. The marks on the pages, the squiggles, as Merlot called them, arranged themselves into shapes and the shapes arranged themselves into words. And the words spelled out a delicious and wonderful phrase. Once upon a time. Once upon a time, whispered Despero. What? said Merlot. Nothing. Eat, said Merlot. I couldn't possibly, said Despero, backing away from the book. There he is standing on the book. Once upon a time. You can see it in the background. Fancy written. Why? Um, said Despero, it would ruin the story. 
The story? What story? Merlot stared at him. A piece of paper trembled at the end of one of her indignant whiskers. So you have to picture her whiskers, her little mouse whiskers, and at the end there was a little piece of paper dangling because she's eating. It's just like Pa said when you were born. Something's not right with you. She turned and scurried from the library to tell her parents about this latest disappointment. Despero waited until she was gone, and then he reached out and with one paw touched the lovely words, once upon a time. He shivered. He sneezed. Achoo! He blew his nose into his handkerchief. Once upon a time, he said aloud, relishing the sound, and then, tracing each word with his paw, he read the story of the beautiful princess and the brave knight who serves and honors her. Despero did not know it, but he would need very soon to be brave himself. Have I mentioned that beneath the castle, under the castle, there were rats, large rats, mean rats. Despero was destined to meet those rats. Reader, you must know that an interesting fate, sometimes involving rats, sometimes not, awaits almost everyone, mouse or man, who does not conform. Conform means to change and be like everybody else. Okay, chapter four, and to the P. This book is so great, isn't it? Despero's brothers and sisters soon abandoned the thankless task of trying to educate him in the ways of being a mouse. And so Despero was free. He spent his days as he wanted. He wandered through the rooms of the castle, staring dreamily at the light streaming in through the castle, through the stained glass windows. He went to the library and read over and over again the story of the fair maiden and the knight who rescued her. And he discovered finally the source of the honey sweet sound. Mm, can't wait to see what it is. <gasps> the sound was music. The sound was King Philip playing his guitar and singing to his daughter, the Princess P, every night before she fell asleep. Hidden in a hole in the wall of the princess's bedroom, the mouse listened with all his heart. The sound of the king's music made Despero's soul grow large and light inside of him. Oh, he said, it sounds like heaven. It smells like honey. Can't you just smell that music? He stuck his left ear out of the hole in the wall so that he could hear the music better. And then he stuck his right ear out so that he could hear better still. Oh, sorry. He stuck his left ear out of the hole in the wall so that he could hear the music better. And then he stuck his right ear out so that he could hear better still. And it wasn't too long before one of his paws followed his head and then another paw. And then without any real planning on Despero's part, the whole of him, that means his whole body, was on display. All in an effort to get closer to the music. Now, while Despero did not indulge in much of the normal behavior of mice, he did adhere to one of the most basic and elemental of all the mice rules. Do not ever, under any circumstances, reveal yourself to humans. But now, the music, the music, the music make him, made him lose his head and act against the few small mouse instincts he was in possession of. And because of this, he revealed himself, and in no time at all, he was spied by the sharp-eyed Princess P. You know what spied means? It's like when you play that game, 
I spy with my little eye a plant. And if you look there, there are plants on my shelf. So spy means to see something. So the Princess P spied Despero. Oh, Papa, she said, look, a mouse. The king stopped singing. He squinted. The king was nearsighted. That is, anything that was not right in front of his eyes was very difficult for him to see. Where, said the king. There, said Princess P. She pointed. That, my dear, is a bug, not a mouse. It is much too small to be a mouse. No, 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 it's a mouse. A bug, said the king, who liked to be right. A mouse, said the pea, who knew she was right. As for Despero, he was beginning to realize that he had made a very grave error. He trembled, he shook, he sneezed, achoo! He considered fainting. As he's frightened, said the pea. Look, he's so afraid he's shaking. Oh, I think he was listening to the music. Play something, Papa. A king play music for a bug? King Philip wrinkled his forehead. Is that proper, do you think? Wouldn't that make this into some kind of topsy-turvy, wrong-headed world if a king played music for a bug? Papa, I told you, he's a mouse, said the pea. Please. Oh, well, if it will make you happy, I, the king, will play music for a bug. A mouse, corrected P. The king adjusted his heavy gold crown. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> he strummed the guitar and started to sing a song about stardust. The song was sweet and light as as light shining through the stained glass windows, as captivating as the story in a book. Despero forgot all his fears. He only wanted to hear the music. He crept closer and then closer still until, reader, he was sitting right at the foot of the king. Chapter 5, What Furlough Saw. Now you see the picture here of the Princess P and Despero. And there's a caption under here and it says, Despero stared up in wonder. I love this book. Chapter 5, What Furlough Saw. The Princess P looked down at Despero. She smiled at him. And while her father played another song, a song about the deep purple falling over sleepy garden walls, the princess reached out and touched the top of the mouse's head. Despero stared up at her in wonder. You have to imagine what that might look like. The P, he decided, that's the name of the princess, the P, he decided, looked just like the picture of the fair maiden in the book in the library. The princess smiled at Despero again. This time, Despero smiled back. And then something incredible happened. The mouse fell in love. Reader, you may ask this question. In fact, you must ask this question. Is it ridiculous for a very small, sickly, big-eared mouse to fall in love with a beautiful human princess named P? And that's P like the vegetable, the little green P. The answer is yes. Of course it's ridiculous. Love is ridiculous. But love is also wonderful and powerful and Despero's love for the Princess P would prove in time to be all of these things, powerful, wonderful, and ridiculous. You're so sweet, said the princess to Despero. You're so tiny. 
As Despero looked up at her adoringly, Herlo happened to scurry past the princess's room, moving his head from left to right, right to left, back and forth. Cripes, said Furlo. He stopped. He stared into the princess's room. His whiskers became as tight as bowstrings. What Furlo saw was Despero Tilling, sitting at the foot of the king. What Furlo saw was the princess touching the top of her brother's head. What Furlo saw... No, cripes, shouted Furlo again. Oh, Christ, he's nuts. He's a goner. That means he's, he's dead. And executing a classic scurry, Furlo went off to tell his father, Lester Tilling, the terrible, unbelievable news of what he had just seen. Chapter 6. This Drum He cannot, he simply cannot be my son, Lester said. He clutched his whiskers with his front paws and shook his head from side to side in despair. Of course he is your son, said Antoinette. What do you mean he is not your son? This is a ridiculous statement. You must always make these ridiculous statements. You, said Lester, this is your fault. The, the French blood in him has made him crazy. C'est moi, said Antoinette. C'est moi? Why must it always be I who takes the blame? If your son is such a disappointment, it is as much your fault as it is mine. Something must be done, said Lester. He pulled on a whisker so hard that it came loose. He waved the whisker over his head. He pointed it at his wife. He will be the end of us all, he shouted. Sitting at the foot of the human king, unbelievable, unthinkable. Oh, so dramatic, said Antoinette. She held out one paw and studied her painted nails. Hmm. Where am I? Painted nails. He is a small mouse. How much of harm can he do? If there is one thing I have learned in this world, said Lester, it is that a man must act like a... It is that mice must act like mice, or else there is bound to be trouble. I will call a special meeting of the Mouse Council. Together we will decide what must be done. Oh, said Antoinette, you and this council of the mouse, it is a waste of time in my opinion. Don't you understand, shouted Lester. He must be punished. He must be brought up before the tribunal. He pushed past her and dug furiously through a pile of paper scraps until he uncovered a thimble with a piece of leather stretched across the open end. So a thimble... I don't have a thimble in my house, but I have this. This is like a medicine cup, you know, and a thimble is like this, but much smaller. And it goes over your finger. And when you're sewing, it fits over your finger perfectly. And when you're sewing, um, it prevents you from getting pricked. So they're mice. They're very small. And this little thimble with a piece of leather strapped over it. I just had a piece of candy, so you can imagine that. So the leather, this is leather, pretend. Leather is like what your shoes are made out of. Like this, and this becomes the drum. Okay, for them. So I'm going to read this part now. So you have to imagine a little drum. Chapter 6, this drum. Oh, okay, so I'm over here. If there's one thing I've learned in this world, it is a mice must, must, mice must act like mice or there is bound to be trouble. I will call a special meeting of the mouse council. Together, we will decide what must be done. Oh, you and this council of the mouse, it is a waste of time in my opinion. Don't you understand? He must be punished. He must be brought up before the tribunal. 
He pushed past her and dug furiously through a pile of scraps until he uncovered a thimble with a piece of leather stretched across the open end. Okay. Oh, please, said Antoinette. She covered her ears. Not this drum of the Council of the Mouths. Yes, said Lester, the drum. He held it up high above his head. First to the north. I have to do this. This is a very dramatic moment. First to the north, then to the south, then to the east, then to the west. Then he lowered it and turned his back to his wife, closed his eyes, and took a deep breath in and began to drum, beat the drum slowly. One long beat with his tail and two staccato beats with his palm. Staccato means fast. Boom, ta ta, boom, ta ta, boom, ta ta. The rhythm of the drum was a signal for the members of the mouse council. Boom, ta ta, boom, ta ta, boom. The beating of the drum let them know that an important decision would have to be made one that affected the safety of the well-being of the entire mouse community. Boom. Okay, I'm going to stop the video here, and I'm going to make a new video of chapter 7 to 12, because that's where we stopped in class so far. And then I guess I'll make more as we go. Bye.